Hey everyone, today I'm taking a look at Crystal Palace, which is a pretty involved Euro strategy economic game designed by Carsten Lauber and published by Capstone Games. This one accommodates two to five players and takes around two hours to play on average. The game is set on the World's Fair in 1851, and the idea is you want to be the nation who showcases the most impressive inventions at the fair. Um, but essentially what it means is you're trying to get the most victory points. So the setup of Crystal Palace is gonna look like this, where you don't actually have a main board per se, you just have a series of these micro boards, all kind of determining a different part of the game and different actions you can take. So you've got the patent office here, you've got the uh, British Museum, the Bank of England, Westminster, the Reform Club, uh, the London Times, the Port of London, Waterloo Station, and you've got the Black Market over here as well. And additionally, each player has their own personal player boards, which look like this, which track a number of different things, such as these storing spaces where you can put these tokens and cover up these potential end game points that you may uh, lose if you don't cover them up. You've also got this newspaper track here, which can give you little kind of abilities that you can use at any time. Um, and you've got these little personal objectives, which differ from nation to nation. So you can see that my, um, my UK nation here wants to get along this track corresponding to Westminster. Additionally, you have the buzz board here, which is another track you're trying to climb to get bonuses along the way and potentially invest in these spots to get more income and points as the game goes on. Uh, to the right of this track, you've got your income track, which determines how much money you're gonna take from round to round. You, don't want to be make, you want to be making sure that you are high as possible on that track because money in this game is extremely tight. You also have the resources such as these cogs and light bulbs. You've got these loan tokens and you've got the money itself as well as all the different um, bits such as the cards, etc. But let's talk about how the game actually works. So the game is gonna play out over five different rounds, two in 1849, two in 1850, and then the final round in 1851. And each of those rounds is gonna be broken up into seven phases here depicted on the bottom of your player boards. The first of which is probably the most significant part of the game and probably the most unique part of the game. So simultaneously, each player is gonna have a number of dice here and they are gonna secretly manipulate them to how they want. So you could, they could put them all threes or they could put you know, whatever whatever orientation they want of these dice. And um, bearing in mind that the, the higher numbers are better than the lower numbers, but bearing in mind that every pip here that you place on these dice means that you have to pay a pound for. So you know if you wanna go all high, that's perfectly fine, but you have to make sure that you have that money in your bank to be able to finance those moves. And the idea is that you're trying to put these dice in the orientation that you want in order to claim the different worker placement spots on these boards here. So you can see that each of these boards has a number of different spots where dice can be placed, um, ranging in different numbers. And that, this is basically the minimum number that you can put on that particular spot. So you'd need to have at least a three on this spot. And you also want to be the person with the highest number on there because that means you're gonna pre pretty much secure your option to take that action because you can see even though there's four dice placement spots here, there's only actually three action spots in order to do that. So say four people put dice there, only three of them are gonna actually resolve the action. And alternatively, some spots have further bonuses you can get on them or even punishments such as this one here where if you place on this spot, you're gonna automatically pay an extra two pounds. So once all players are happy and have revealed their dice simultaneously, you're gonna pay that money and then whoever's put the highest pit value or the total combined highest pit value of their dice are gonna be the first player and whoever's put the lowest is gonna take um, one of these um, newspaper points by going up this track here, which will let you do different things at any time, such as um, spending four of them to get an additional die. Um, you can spend three to get the income track, two to get a cog, one for, for one money ratio, and you can even do those alternative actions such as spending four to get a light bulb, five money to get a cog, or one light bulb or one cog to get a pound. And then in turn order, you're going to be placing your dice that you've just manipulated onto the different action boards. And then once they're all placed, you're going to start resolving all the different action boards in order. So the patent office here lets you reserve one of these patent cards, which is a big way you're going to get points and basically the inventions in the game. So you can see here that this um, beer glass counter uh, requires two cogs and five light bulbs in order to build it. And this part at the bottom here is going to be the reward for doing so. And even some of them have a little bit of a punishment too, such as losing money, but normally it's worth doing that. And you can also see here in the top right hand corner that you are usually incentivized to build things earlier in the game because you can see here, if I build this beer glass counter in 
1949, I'm going to get massive 24 points. But if I wait until 1951, then I'm only going to get 13 points. Additionally, you don't actually buy these outright and just um, have them straight away. You're essentially reserving them um, to be able to build them later in a, uh, in a future round when it comes to phase five. Um, I did mention as well that some of these spots have this little assistant action which you can take immediately if you go in one of those spots. And that corresponds to two different things. And the first of which is to do your personal objective here which can get you end game points. And the second of which corresponds to the black market here where you can optionally pay an amount of money to put one of your little helpers on that track and paying the amount of money if you need to. And what that means is that when it comes to a later phase in phase six, you're going to get the corresponding bonus to the right hand side here. Now, additionally, if you don't want to place a new one on there, you can move another one up to the next available spot um, in order to keep them on that track and keep them pushing up. Because at the end of each round, everyone on the black market is going to slip down one spot, potentially kicking you off that board. You can also see that some of these cards have a person associated to them. And basically what that means is that if you have a matching pair of the actual invention itself and the matching person from this board here, then you can get an additional four points for doing so. Uh, the British Museum lets you take one of these little telescope tiles and put them on your player board, either getting an instant reward or an ongoing reward. So you can see this one here will get me a cog and two money instantly, but this one here will get me a pound every single time it comes to phase six. And when you take one of these, you're gonna put them on your little board here, covering up one of these spots. Um, as I mentioned earlier, each one of these empty spots at the end of the game is gonna make you suffer negative two points. You've got the Bank of England here, which where you get these, um, these different share tiles from and they are going to help you go up the income track and even get you victory points and this is quite an important part of the game that's um, quite sought after. Uh, you've got the Westminster track here which basically means that you get rewards as you go along such as getting money or getting to use a tile again or getting light bulbs but additionally the Westminster track helps you when it comes to the next board which is the Reform Club where you can buy these people because you can see when it comes to phase four in the game, each of these different characters has a wage that you need to pay depending on how far you are along on that Westminster track. So you can see here, this um, Queen Victoria card will cost me a massive six pounds if I'm only on the first spot of the Westminster track. But if I get to the back area right at the end, it's only gonna cost me two pounds per round, which is not so bad. And these are much like the patent cards where you know the earlier you build them, generally the better they get, or not always, but this one here actually gets better the more you, um, the later you build it. But again, they correspond to the patent cards and will cost you resources to buy them, but you get those instantly. So you need to make sure you have the funds in your pocket ready to spend. The London Times board is basically uh, ongoing objectives that you can claim. So if each round, or yeah, each round in the game is gonna to correspond to a certain objective criteria. So you can see here, the first one in 1849 requires to have a certain amount of assistance on the black market. Uh, the Port of London board gives you these one-off bonuses that you can take once per round, such as taking these assistant actions, getting cogs, um, getting a new die into your fold so you've got more options, or taking one of these ticket actions where you can forfeit a dice uh, die in order to get an amount of points. And again, the earlier you do that, the more points you're going to get. So it's a bit of a speculative punt. And then you go to the Waterloo station, which basically gets you these rewards, such as getting two light bulbs, a light bulb and activating a six tile, or getting a light bulb and two up the buzz track. When you get to certain points on the buzz track here, you can get these one-off bonuses, again, such as unlocking uh, a new die, or getting character cards, or getting these telescope tiles. But when you get to these poster marks here, you can optionally choose to give up one of your two discs to claim that spot, which will give you an ongoing bonus every single round. For example, I put my disc here, which means I have the option to go two more up the buzz track or take two pounds every time that part of the game triggers. But the further you go up this track and, and kind of forfeit those bonuses as you go, you can potentially get these higher ones, such as getting a massive income of points every single round. And additionally, at the end of the game, whoever's got the highest up these tracks gets an amount of points, you know, the first player's gonna get six points, second four, and third two points. And that also um, relates to the black market as well, where again, the first, second, or third person up there highest at the end of the game is gonna get three, two, or one points respectively. 
So once you've picked your dice, you've placed your dice, you've resolved all the action boards, you've paid your wages, activated only four tiles, you have the option then to purchase or build two of your reserved patent cards, again, paying the resources to do so, getting the rewards um, if you want to, and um, getting the points and um, even um, the pairing bonuses if you have the corresponding people. And after that, you're going to take your income based on where you are on the income track and then everybody has to go down three on that income track which is another reason why you want to keep pushing up this track here because every round you're going to keep falling meaning that you're getting less and less money round after round. You're also then going to get any rewards based on the buzz track. Everyone is then going to slide down on the black market track and then you're going to re-rack all the different um, resources and things, all the cards ready for the next round. Okay, so let's get into my review of Crystal Palace. So I think the main thing to talk about and the starting point I should start with is the actual dice bidding mechanism itself. I think that mechanism is absolutely fantastic and I'm massively surprised that it's never been seen before this game where you have your dice here, you can actually choose the orientation of these bids but bearing in mind that it's going to cost you a pretty penny if you want to guarantee those first dibs on all these different action spots. And striking that balance is a really crucial decision. Now, you don't want to spend too much because maybe somebody's bid um, all low on their dice. And you don't want to you know, overspend and you know, when you could have got it for cheaper. But additionally, these boards are very tight so that if you don't kind of go quite confidently to a higher bid, then there's a good chance you're going to sh get shut out of taking an action at all. And striking that balance is a really strong part of the game. And that all ties back to the money management and the economic side of the game. So this game is probably one of the tightest games in terms of money management that I've ever played. Now you do start with a nice little um, bunch of cash, but before you know it, that cash starts bleeding away and away and away, and you're just pretty much scraping for every single pound you can get, which means that you really are fighting over these shares tokens to make sure that you keep climbing this track because every single round you are falling down on this income track which can be crippling if you do not manage that and there just isn't the opportunity for people to get these tiles every single round meaning that somebody is going to have to pay and you're already on that knife edge as well at all times in, in taking these loans because whenever you go below a set well whenever you run out of money and you have to you pay your money you have to take one of these loan tiles um, which are going to suffer you make you suffer a massive um, penalty in points but they'll give you a 10 a 10 pound um, loan and then you can pay back those 10 pounds at a later date in order to reduce that negative points but that's still you don't want to be doing that because again suffering negative five points each um, or for every loan you'd have is um, going to really cost you at the end of the game while I absolutely love that money management of you know how much can I spend, how much do I need to keep back to pay my to pay my employees because again they're going to cost money. Um, can I reduce that by going on that Westminster track? How much money have I got incoming next round through these bonuses and things, um, and even like the upgrades and income track, and just that economic puzzle of mathing things out to the precise level, knowing what you can spend and what you can't spend is where the game really shines. But you have to understand that that is potentially going to be turn a lot of people off because of the potential for analysis paralysis here. So I think it's kind of the elephant in the room. Really. When you have a game that could be this perfectly and precisely mapped out, you are going to get people trying to min-max every single placement, which is fine and a big part of the game. But bearing in mind that this is what you're getting into when you play this game. It is a very strict, a very tight and a very precise style of economic game, which is going to lead some people into that zone of you know, taking long, drawn out, very carefully planned turns rather than just going with the, um, you know, go, go with the gut reactions, hoping things work out. You know, if you do that, it's probably going to cost you where if you are more kind of mathematically inclined, and like to map things out and you don't really mind taking that bit of time to ponder over your turn to make things you're getting get, getting things right uh, if you are that type of player then you're probably going to get a lot out of this game there is also another layer of potential analysis paralysis because when you actually map out all your dice and um you know worked out perfectly what you need to pay and what you can pay and where you mean to place them and because you're doing that simultaneously secretly and then you reveal you then kind of have to very carefully remember exactly where you intended to place each of your die which is um, which can be annoying because sometimes you think you know I really want that one to go there I want that one to go there I've mapped this up perfectly but when it comes back to your turn you might forget where you intended and have to work it all out again and start from scratch 
And despite me really enjoying the tightness and the money management part of the game, I do think that falling three down on that income track every round is a little bit too punishing. Um, so it did feel like you were really working hard just to keep your head afloat in the game, which I suppose is that good kind of tension. You know, I never have actually found myself forced to take a loan. So maybe I'm just being a bit pedantic there. But maybe two would have been a bit better for me. The tightness for the worker placement spots themselves is also palpable. And that does, again, tie back to how much you're going to bid for these um, for these dice faces. Because you know sometimes you both really want this spot here. And you both prepare a really high, um, high die face. So therefore, you end up spending all that money. And then somebody's going to get shut out, which can become very frustrating if you have bid quite a lot of money. Because, again, because money is so tight. But that really is... Uh, dependent on the way you look at it you know that does just really ramp up the decision space and how much you have to plan things and prepare for contingencies i also think that the variation of the different inventions is great you know, they all offer really cool rewards and even sometimes hindrances and you need to kind of math out what the net gain is going to be from that but i also think that the attention to detail on the way that the score is fantastic because if you have a certain type of card that's going to constantly give you um, a benefit each round, then it's probably going to be worth fewer points if you get it earlier. Whereas if you buy it later and you don't get the rewards or the benefit from it so many times, then you get compensated through victory points. And I think this is actually a part of board gaming that is massively ignored. I've only ever seen a few games utilize this as it should be to keep things balanced and to keep that incentive to purchase these cards later in the game, even if you wouldn't you know, squeeze the uh, benefit from them time and time again. So I do really like that. But something I wasn't massively keen on was the way that these cards pair with the characters themselves because often the the partnerships won't even come up because you can only ever uh, have kind of three characters available each time and three inventions available each time. Yes, you can reserve them and um, keep them back for a later turn and waiting until the character comes out. But sometimes just passively, you'll find yourself getting those four extra points where somebody might work equally as hard and not get those four extra points. So that's something that I didn't think was completely necessary for the game. The desire to go all to all the different locations is great. You, know, you, need the, um, you need the cards, of course, to get your points. You need these telescopes to stop you from um, suffering all those negative points and to get the ongoing benefits or one-off benefits. The um, you know the shares themselves are crucial to make sure you've got the income and the points there. Uh, the Westminster track, while the benefits aren't great, you want to be making sure that you're not having to pay those wages every single round. And the characters are a bit cheaper and can offer some cool benefits as well. Um, the objectives offer a good way to climb up that buzz track to get to those checkpoints. These ones here will give you a little injection of resources that you might need or get you on that black market track to make sure you're getting more income each round. And um, again, the same applies to the Waterloo Station. So everything is great and you want to go to everything and you'll find yourself kind of dipping your toes in all the different regions, all the different boards, um, which is what you want. You know, there's not a part of the game that's completely neglected. So there are a ton of decisions you have to make and you know balancing it all together is all part of this Euro economic simulation puzzle, which I think is very well executed. And even the actual, the way the game flows and uh, you know the, the pacing of the game is decent. You know, it is seven phases, which is normally a bit overkill, but they are all pretty digestible in their own right. And um, it's not gonna be too much of an overhead just, to, just after a round or two to understand how it flows and how it works. So yeah, I'm surprised actually how well it does work and how smoothly it operates um, despite it being a relatively heavy game. Now I will say that the black market is probably the part of the game that feels the least intuitive out of everything um, because there is this option where if you're in this kind of part of the board here that when you place one of your workers you can slip down and take one of these cogs and it just felt a little bit unnecessary and a bit, I don't just felt a little bit extra and a bit too fussy for me. Now, I did mention at the start of the video, this game does take around two hours to play on average. That is going to be give or take depending on that player count. And I will say that kind of corresponds to the uh, the scalability of the game. I really can't ever see myself ever wanting to play this with more than three players, to be honest, because there is so much mapping out and so much potential for careful planning and that meticulous AP style of gameplay. And um, whereas if it gets to that four or five player, player count, it's just gonna to become too long, too paralyzing. And even the bidding mechanism is gonna become a bit too chaotic and just too unpredictable where you can't really get into the head of your opponent and understand what they're going to do. I think the replayability for Crystal Palace is decent. You know, everybody's got their own different nation board here and there's a ton of these and they're double-sided for all these different objectives, just to give a slight different feel. Um, additionally, the setup of the buzz track is gonna be different from game to game where all these different things go in different spots. 
Of course, the different characters are going to come out in different orders. Uh, the the uh, inventions are going to come out in different orders. And you've also got these um, London Times part as well, where, again, from game to game, the actual objective that you go for is going to change and therefore might kind of change the pacing of the game and change what you're going to go for in terms of strategy. The interaction of the game is passive, which is probably what you want if you're playing a game like this anyway. But I will stress again that the competition and the fierceness to get to these worker placement spots is really hot. So you need to make sure that you are, um, you know, bearing in mind what the other people are doing. And you can't just hope for the best and think that, you know, I'm going to get a nice spot there. Because even if you do, it's probably going to cost you extra money, which you might not be able to afford. So yeah, you really do need to consider about what the other people do. And they are going to really dictate what you can and can't do on your turn which again ties back to the planning and just general interaction of the game. So again, not only have you got the competition of the action spots, but maybe you're both after the same um, character, maybe you're both after the same invention. So it's just all that kind of classic Euro passive nature, which you'd probably expect from a game like this. I think the production for this game is generally of a very high standard. Uh, it does have that more kind of classical beige style, style Euro feel, um, but the cards themselves all look great and they're of a high quality. Iconography is generally good. There are a few things we had to look in the rulebook to see how some characters worked in things, but that, that was generally an exception. Um, and I would say that I would have much preferred this to be on maybe one larger board because if it was a bit messy and a bit scatty to be all these different boards um, sprawled around the table and it becomes a bit of a table hog, you know, once you've got it all set up, there's just stuff everywhere, which can be a bit, you know, a bit too much um, consuming in terms of the space it takes. But um, everything else works fine. You, know, you can clearly see what everything does. All the cardboard stock is of a high quality. The dice are decent. All the wooden pieces are decent, you know, these assistants and things. And even all the cardboard tokens, such as the money, the wooden resources, and the loans, all of a high standard, um, which you'd probably expect from Capstone Games. Okay, so let's get into my final thoughts on Crystal Palace. So straight up, I think this game is rock solid. There's a lot to be enjoyed here if you like this style of game. The tightness and the way you have to manage your, um, your funds and your resources is so tense and it's a really kind of engaging part of the game that I enjoy a lot. Maybe a little bit too punishing at times, but again, that's, that's what you're kind of signing up for if you get into this game. I do think that if you like these style of games, you're pretty much a banker to enjoy this one. But I think if you're on the fence with a game like this, this isn't going to change your mind or isn't going to have anything unique enough or interesting enough to make you think, yeah, this is the game that's going to break that trend and maybe try an economic Euro simulation game like this. But um, I would say that the kind of main takeaway for me is the actual dice bidding mechanism itself. I think that's a brilliant idea. I'd love to see it be used again in different games because I think it just adds so much um, interesting choice. And when it's tied to you know, how much you're going to spend for doing that, it's just um, a brilliant idea. And again, I'm surprised it hasn't been used before. Uh, there's a lot of plates you need to spin when playing this game keeping your money afloat, um, making sure you're covering up all these negative spaces, getting your income, um, obviously buying the cars themselves. Um, everything is worth dipping your toe into and exploring it all. And it all comes together pretty smoothly considering. Now that does have a couple of rough edges for me, but I think that really takes away from the gameplay experience itself. I think it's rock solid and I can see why this game is so revered. Um, I think the issue for me personally is that I have so many dice placement style games that I'm not sure if this one really stands above the rest. I think it's probably on a similar level, um, but I'm not sure if the actual dice placement system that I enjoy a lot is enough to make me keep it around. So despite me enjoying the game a lot, I'm not sure if it's gonna carve a place in my collection for long term. But I certainly think if you enjoy this style of game, this is definitely one you're going to check out. It doesn't do anything tremendously new, but it does what it does well. And it you know, it works well for a heavier style game. It does, you know, it, it works remarkably smoothly and it makes a lot of sense once you get the initial rules overhead out of your system. So it's a solid game, um, a very tight punishing game. But again, if you enjoy that style of thing, you're probably going to enjoy this one a lot. Um, and I say this one is definitely worthy of a shield of quality. I can't certainly take away from the gameplay itself. And I think it um, definitely has a certain pedigree of uh, being a well-designed, well-ironed out and a clever game that's going to absolutely frazzle your brain at times. 